advice and opinions expressed by Dr. Grant Pichet and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. Dr. Doreen Grant Pichet is an expert in autism. Doreen Grant Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grant Pichet. Dr. Doreen Grant Pichet is a visionary in the field of autism. Now you can ask the questions on Ask Dr. Doreen. Good morning and welcome to Ask Dr. Doreen. I'm Shannon Pettis. I'm here with Dr. Doreen Grant Pichet. Good morning. Good morning, Shannon. Good morning, everyone. So thrilled to be here. Thank you. It's lovely to be here. And so thrilled to be here with you guys. I, I will say this is one of my favorite hours of the week. I enjoy being with my kid, too. That's the only <laughs> thing that rates higher than you. But I enjoy this because you and I get to have Dr. Grampiche all to ourselves for an hour. It's fun. It's Amazing. a lot of fun for me just to kind of get in touch with the families and, you know, talk hear, about their kids. And kind of hear the pulse of yeah. what's going on. Uh, so if you happen to be joining us for the first time, let me tell you, welcome. Uh, and you're here with Dr. Grampy Shane. If you don't know her, she's a true expert in the field of autism. She's been working in this field for over 40, I'm saying four zero years. I think it's much more than that. But I really can't get my head wrapped around that because that can't possibly be true. But she has been working in this field that long and really being such a voice for people on the spectrum. All ages, from very young babies up through senior citizens and everything in between. I don't think there's anybody else who has a bigger heart, more compassion and empathy for individuals who are on the spectrum and helping them to get to enrich things in their lives that matter to them. Thank not you. putting something on them that's, you know, not useful, but helping them to get to things that are important to them. I hope so. Thank you. It's my pleasure always. And I, I have been the beneficiary of that. If you watch the show, you know um, that my son was treated um, through your program and your training, and it has made all the difference in our lives. Thank so God. That's awesome. I'm never going to be done saying thank you. <laughs> Don't want to get all emotional right away. But I'm um, thrilled that we have this opportunity so that you guys can ask her questions. And that's really what this hour is about. From all over the world, wherever you are, you can be writing in right now. We're live on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter, and about a dozen other sites. And our wonderful Chris Desmond, I was just saying that at least five times a day, we say, thank God for Chris Desmond, uh, because he's so amazing. He's going to show you on the screen some of the different ways that you guys can connect, some of the different ways that you can be writing in your question, whether it's live, which we are right now. Today is Tuesday. It's January, what is it, the 30th? Yes. The yes. 30th. 2024, and uh, but then the show will podcast later on and be available really until the end of time, I think, um, to anybody who is interested. You should know that we are in our 14th year of this program, so there are 14, 13 plus years, since we're in the 14th year, of episodes that you can go back and search and say, what did Dr. Grant Pichet say about this? Um, you can go to our website. Um, you can you know, which is Autism Network, uh, by the way, or you can go to her website, Ask Dr. Doreen. You can search topics and go back and look through the wide variety of answers that there have been, but you can also ask a question live right now and, and be as specific as possible so she has as much information to answer. I was talking about the podcast, though. There are podcasts, so you can watch on YouTube, and if you watch on YouTube, you can be watching the old episodes of Ask Dr. Doreen on YouTube slash Autism Live, or you can go to YouTube slash Ask Dr. Doreen, and there are all the, the current ones and more and more of the backlog are being put there, um, so you have your choice of those. But the podcast is its own podcast right now, so please go and wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe to the Ask Dr. Doreen podcast, and then you'll get every week, it'll show up in your feed and you'll have it. And you have the ability to take it with you as you go on a walk or go for a drive. You know that many of you like to listen if you're somebody who likes to watch. Because I always want to see what shoes Dr. Grant is wearing. <laughs> She's got great taste in clothes and shoes. I always like to see if you want to watch, then go to YouTube um, and watch it either on Autism Live or on Ask Dr. Green. If you want the podcast and you don't want to get advertisement, because let's be real, we have to keep the lights on here. We don't charge you anything because that's important to us that you get this information 
free of charge, but somebody's got to pay the bill, right? So we have sponsors. And if you really don't want to have the podcast with the sponsors, then if you like to, you can pay for an ad-free version. You go to glow.fm slash autism live. When you do that and you pay monthly, you get both autism live and ask Dr. Doreen and you get it without ads. So that's a good deal if that's the thing you're interested in. I'm saying already good morning to Susie B and Rodney Cox. So um, please don't forget to like, share, and review because that's what helps us to be able to bring you more programming all the time. And we've got some exciting things happening because on the Autism Network, we're about to launch uh, a couple of new things, but in particular, uh, Autismo y Comunidad with Gabriela Tessier. I'm so excited about that. All in Espanol. It's fantastic. Isn't that wonderful? It is. It's so exciting. Yeah. So make when sure is that starting? Well, we're, we're filming and we're doing a little bit of a bank of them. I'm hoping in April. That's awesome. We'll be able to launch That's them. exciting. And Very Gabriella, exciting. you guys know her. She's the morning anchor on Univision. She's, That's right. Uh, she's an Emmy Award winning journalist. And she's amazing. Yeah, she is. She's amazing. Um, and she's a board member of Autism Kids Today. Today. That's right. So um, we, we've we known Gabriella. You've known her for a long, long, long time. time. Very yeah. excited that she's a huge fan of I'm a huge fan of hers. Well, um, <laughs> you know, I, we, it's, we're all fans of both of you. Let's say that and leave that alone. Uh, but anyway, our, we always start with a topic every day, but then we'll take questions on any subject whatsoever. So feel free to start writing in. I always encourage you, don't wait to the last minute. I know we get to the half hour mark and then all of a sudden people go, we have oh, hundred questions. I'd like to ask a question, then we get to the... We've got 15 minutes left, and I've got a stack of questions. Is when everybody asks a question, and that <laughs> I have to be honest, that stresses me out a little bit because I want you to get the answers to your questions. So ask early and often, like they say about voting. Today's topic, though, is educationally enriched environment. We're going to start with that. Um, the first question that somebody asked was, "What do you mean when you say educationally enriched environment?" Because you say this a lot. Sure, sure, yeah. And so I always go back to. Uh, you know, studies that have shown for many, many years that uh, the more you, I guess, engage and activate the brain, the more you keep the brain busy, uh, the more growth there is and more learning. And it makes sense, obviously, because uh, especially if it's early in one's life, but also later in life, like, you know, early in one's life, what you're doing is if you're engaging in activities that are problem solving, let's say, or even if you go very early in life, if you have a lot of, it's, you know, I'll give you an example. When a baby is born right at the very beginning and they cannot see colors yet, they just basically see black, white, or red, you are, you could buy as a parent a lot of these uh, stimuli that like you can put it behind the driver's seat or in a mobile or something and the baby is looking at all these like patterns that are black, white, and red. The reason for that is that when you uh, visually engage, so when you're showing the the baby, the infant, all these various stimuli, you're producing growth of nerve cells, dendrites and axons are growing in the brain, and you're causing like more connections, right, between the, the various parts of the brain. And then later, of course, as the child starts to understand, it's about language and it's about giving them a lot of sensory feedback and then gradually it's just about uh, learning and uh, you know giving them all the different things that help them learn and problem solve and, he, and now you can fast forward all the way to as a senior and they you know we have like crossword puzzles or wordle or any kind of problem solving thing and they say if you do that every day it's very good to keep your brain active and so the concept is the same when we're talking about an educationally enriched environment. And I'm really glad you're bringing this up, Shannon, because one of the things that is really important is for parents and for you know clinicians, everyone to realize that any kind of engagement is better than no engagement. Like activation of the brain has to do with just someone interacting with you, presenting stimuli to you, presenting things that are maybe challenging or just not even challenging, but entertaining, like just keeping your brain active. 
is, is a very good thing. And the reason that I say this right now is because I'm working on, uh, you know, trying to figure out within CARD why there are so many difficulties with matching our behavior therapists, our technicians to children and providing all the hours of intervention that a child is authorized to receive. And sometimes it's because uh, a supervisor may feel like, or a parent may feel like, oh, I already have four or five people working with my child. I don't want an additional one. I don't want to have a sixth person. And, you know, it is true that it's harder for a supervisor to manage when there's six or seven people. But for the child, it is always beneficial to have one more hour, even if it's with one other person. It is always better to have some form of educational or, you know, any kind of brain activity than not. Than like just you know not doing anything or, or you know not paying attention to some educational stimulus. Absolutely, I always think back because you know you, you think everything in life prepares you for where you need to be when you need to be. And um, my dad had a stroke very early in life, and, um, and because of that, he lost most of his language and he had to relearn language. And I remember being in my twenties and my dad being this way, and it was so frustrating to me. A lot of what I learned about him having a stroke and relearning his language ended up helping me when Jen was diagnosed with autism. And one of the things that I remember very distinctly, my parents retired because my dad couldn't work anymore, and they were living on a farm in Iowa, and they bought a riding mower because my mom said, this will keep you busy. You could be on the riding mower, and you can go out and mow, but it would take him like four hours to mow the entire because of the farm, you know? Yeah, yeah. And, and he would come back in he couldn't talk for the rest of the day because it was a mindless activity. Right. He was right. only doing this and only doing that. And she went to the doctor and the doctor was like, no, that is just the wrong horrible. Thing for him. You need to give him puzzles That's right. and things that activate his brain and engage him right. and challenge him and ask him questions and you know, and, and have him doing crafts and things like that that are hard, that are not so hard that they're frustrating, but just on the cusp of it. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, get him involved in those things. And and so, you know, when when Jen was diagnosed, I realized, oh, we got to do so much more of yeah. that. Yeah. Because otherwise, he will go into his, he had a very yeah. rich life that was happening inside his head that we couldn't get into. Right. Um, but right. making it so that, the thing for me is that I used to be a teacher, so it wasn't that hard for me. But one of the questions we had from somebody, this really struck a chord with me. They said, I'm not a teacher, so I don't naturally think of things to do with my kids when they're at home. Is there a class I can take or to learn how to or a site that, I, that tells me exactly what to do? What advice do you have for the people who aren't thinking about, they, they, don't, they haven't worked in a field of, okay, this is how I engage a child and keep. Yeah. A lot of people put the kids in front of the television set or an iPad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's a great question because, honestly, it's not one that I had ever thought of before, like that, that it's an issue for parents to know kind of what material to present or what exactly to do with their child. So um, I think depending on the age of the child, there's a lot of resources out there, right? So if your child is – I would start – I mean, like this is just an example – I would start with just uh, buying workbooks, right? Workbooks are really easy. We actually have a lot of worksheets yes. on our, I think, on my website, which is one of the resources that I want to make available to parents. Yes. It's also on skills. Because I think that uh, worksheets, not to, not to, you know, just put a worksheet in front of a child and then leave them, but to give you an idea of the type of stuff that your child should be engaging in right now. Because it's important to be um, age level. And when I say age level, I don't mean chronological age. When you're talking about a child who has, let's say, a, a sort of like autism or some other thing going on, ADHD, whatever it might be, you want to give them material that is at their mental age level and then start to gradually make it harder or higher levels. So a child might be eight, but their level of functioning might be three, and you want to start at what a typically developing three-year-old would be functioning. So, 
so that it's not like way beyond the child's capability. It has to be within something that they can engage in, right? And that could be, and then you gradually, as they master that, obviously, you go higher and higher. But you want to make it so that the child has a, um, different types of input. So, for example, it's one thing if you're doing, let's say, calculations, right? So, um, for those of you who like Sudoku, I, I always mispronounce that, that's all pure math calculation, right? So, that has to do with one part of your brain and one type of functioning, which happens to also be the same area of your brain that is activated with music. So you can either do math or music, right? And those both are really working on one particular area of your brain. Um, the other things could be just, you know, word-related problem solving. Uh, th th and again, it goes back to the child. Like if it's a younger child, you want to do things like drawing. That's a very creative. You want to also give the child the ability to develop their creative side. We're just talking about Chris and how creative he is, right? So there's all these different things. You also want to maybe see what the child is interested in. A lot of children are interested in mechanical type things, right? And you want to be able to give them the opportunity to build, for instance. Um, those are all developmental things that you can do. And I'm sure these days, obviously, if you Google that, like my child is three, what types of activities are good for him? It is really just about not letting the child drift off, right, as you said, and keeping them very engaged. Skills, of course, the, the platform that we built does go based on kind of mental age. So it starts with asking the parent a lot of questions about the child's capabilities, and then it gives you a less, list of lessons that you can engage your child in. You don't really need something like that. You can also just go with um, stimuli that are for sale. As you know, Shannon, one of the things we're doing now is um, we are uh, partnering with Stages Learning, and they have fantastic materials um, that we will be um, making available to our families. And these are all very, very important for a child's development. I don't think people realize, you know, I was looking at the Stages material and I love them because they are very well made and they have beautiful cards with pictures, but they also have three dim dimensional objects. Like there's a picture of a, a sheep and there's an actual plastic sheep. It's really identical and looks really, really good. I, one thing I'll tell you as, as a parent is that when we do IQ tests, tests of intelligence, we use very much the same material. It's very similar to that. So becoming familiar with these types of materials for kids automatically helps them be much more comfortable when someone is testing their intelligence, right? Because right? yeah. they've already seen these and so on. So there's lots and lots of resources for parents. It's just a matter of, I think the biggest issue is to schedule the child, especially like, you know, if you remember, we pulled out all our worksheets when COVID first started, yes. right? And it was yes. hard for parents to keep their children busy. Yes. And that's what it is. It's about scheduling and make sure that you schedule you give free time, like motor activity as well. So like you do a little bit of sitting down, then maybe a little bit of running around outside, biking or whatever, then coming back, maybe, you know, uh, making some food with you, like yeah. different types of activities, but just keeping the child busy. And put it on a visual schedule so the child oh, can always. see what's coming. Yeah. And, and you're reminding me because you said COVID and I was like, oh, right. I have a list that's a. It started out as yeah. 101 yeah. things to do with your kids, right. and that's that exists somewhere. We'll find it. And CJ Yaki also made a list of sites that you could go to that have games and things that you can play with your child. But you know what you reminded me of is on our YouTube channel we have a playlist that's called Smarty, and Smarty oh, right. is all videos that are aligned with skills. Even before you go to skills, to sort of get a feel. For what they're all craft projects, the wonderful Suzanne Mashinsky yeah. hosted these for us and made them, and she's so creative. And, and it's like a project that you do with your child, and she, you know, it, it's like a three minute video, but she shows you here's what you need to have, here's how you do it, and here are the skills that you will be working on. And it shows you where the lesson is and skills if you 
happen to be using skills, but you can also use it without skills. And yeah. there's probably like 20 of them on that playlist because we had her doing it for a couple of years. So, and they're available on YouTube. Go to Smarty if you need well, a place to start. Is, this is what I mean. Like, we've produced so much stuff I that know. I really want all of them in one place for parents. Yeah. yeah. It's got to be one place. We're working on it. We're working on it. Okay. Uh, we've got some questions that came in. Nancy, I haven't seen you in so long. This is so great to hear from you. So great to have you watching. She says, what was the result of the study CARD participated in regarding fecal transplant? Is there going to be any action changes in treatment to, uh, to follow follow-up studies? Great question, Nancy. Yeah. So CARD did not participate in a fecal transplant study, but there have been a lot of fecal transplant studies going on. The main person to go to about this is Jim Adams in Arizona. He's, I think he's at the University of Arizona. It's important to contact Jim. They're actually embarking on a new program now having to do with fecal transplants, um, and they're fundraising for it. Um, and there has been some pretty significant finding with fecal transplants for kids who have very, very poor, uh, you know, very significant GI inflammation due to uh, not having a good, uh, you know, bacteria in their gut. The fecal transplant process has to be done exactly right, and it's, a, you know, a very precise procedure, but it does very quickly uh, produce a healthy, a GI environment for a child once they've received a transplant of uh, fecal matter that has the good bacteria. Um, so, and it is, it's, you know, starting to become something that more and more people are interested in, and uh, I think their study is fantastic, and Jim has done amazing work, um, but it is something that you should probably interact with Jim Adams about. I will say that one of the things I'm trying to do at CARD is that I'm trying very hard to bring back a kind of understanding that uh, our kids need to have medical care as well as ABA. And we're partnering with a, a number of different healthcare institutions, physicians, so that all of our patients can have this type of intervention, or not just this, but any kind of intervention that is necessary for them, medical intervention which will obviously help the child then kind of learn faster with their ABA. I do think, I know she put fecal transplant there, because I think that's where we all thought the, the poop study that CARD did do was going to lead to. Oh, and I, I think see. that's what she's referring to. Oh, but I think it's important for us to talk about fecal transplant. And I'm assuming, Nancy, yeah. that that's, but there was, I call it the poop study. That was not what it was called. It was a long time um, ago. That was a long time ago. Um, but, um, yeah. and, COVID kind of got in the way of that. Um, I'm not sure. Here. Yeah, uh, that was we were just providing samples at, to try to start analyzing again the the kind of you know the environment of the GI tract of children on the spectrum. And I think five years later now, or ten years later, or however long it is. Um, it's pretty clear that not just kids with autism, but a lot of individuals do not have a healthy uh, environment in their in their GI tract. And, uh, you know, that's a, <coughs> it's a longer discussion, but it's about uh, our, what we've done in the U.S., unfortunately, is that over time we have produced an extremely clean, hygienic environment. And as a result of that, as a result of overuse of antibiotics as a result of all of our food being GMO. And there's a lot of different reasons that the biota in the gut just becomes uh, wrong, right? And like we don't have the right percentages of good bacteria. Most people, I would say, in the States struggle with this. Um, and so these, this is one way of replacing the bacteria in the gut, and it is very important, of course, because if you don't have the right bacteria in the gut, it leads to all kinds of inflammation, which can then lead to 
BT gut and many other types of issues. And brain um, fog. Brain fog and lots of other you yeah, know, more lots very of serious stuff. problems, yes. Lots and lots of stuff. NH says, um, Shannon, when you talked about a very rich life inside Jem's head, that reminds me so much of my son. He's six, fully verbal, but pe- spends a lot of time in his imagination dreams, as he calls them. Did that slowly fade over time, or did it happen at, at around a certain age? He's so different when he's in his head. Sometimes it's like talking to a wall versus when he's engaging. I will say that for Jem, the path out for him was being able to communicate his ideas. And that um, what we discovered is that he's a writer. And that it's perfectly acceptable for him to have this rich inner life that's imaginative and creative because he has a pathway to put it on paper yep. and share it with people. Yep. I don't know that that's the best <coughs> for your child, but for Jem, we saw a huge difference that he was much more willing to share when he had the ability to communicate what was going on in there. And we made it so that it was a positive experience. For definitely. Us. Definitely. Yeah. I love that. I think I, I was going down the same path in regards to this. I think that you need to kind of interact with what's going on in the child's head. And there's two things I would say you have to do. One is like you have to pull that information out through writing, through drawing, through just storytelling, through music, through whatever, seeing them a camera and letting them film camera. and set up characters. Yeah. All, any, yeah. and all kids are different, right? And some kids can't vocalize to that level, but uh, they can sing about it. Or there's like yeah. different things. So they can paint. Painting yes. is a way to get yes. it out. So I think that uh, it's important to do that, but it's also important to uh, limit it to a certain period of time. So set shifting is, becomes very yes. important because um, there are children, as I'm imagining, as you're saying, and it's, is that you can't, it's hard to pull them out because they, they're kind of in a zone, right? They're, they're just somewhere else. So I would do a few things just to, and I don't know your sh- your child, and I don't want to alarm you in any way, but I think it would be important to first just practice set shifting. Set shifting is uh, getting the child to switch from one activity or one brain uh, engagement to another, right? So, like, I'm watching TV, but mom calls me. I need to stop that and pay attention to mom, and I know that I will come back. Um, And especially if he's engaged in this, I would really practice that frequently with him and make sure that the activity that you're trying to get him to uh, focus on is rewarding and positive because what's going on in his head is rewarding and positive and so you want to make sure the transition is not going from a preferred activity to a non-preferred activity so maybe you know just calling him and making sure he can uh, look over at, let's say, some new thing you've bought for him, or look at the TV, or show him a picture, or something like that. That switching, which is called set shifting, is so, so, so important to brain activity, and to life, and to being able to get through everything in life, um, and to learning. Because unless you're set shifting, you stay in this kind of bubble, and you're missing everything that's going on around you. So teaching him that is very important. If you find that it is extremely difficult to get him out of his thoughts, then just do, you know, contact a a university clinic and um, ask, make sure he's not having subclinical seizures. Sometimes our kids um, are completely, like parents will come and say, like, sometimes he's so zoned out, I can't even get his attention no matter what I do. They're having a a seizure. It's just a very, very minute seizure, so it doesn't really show up in behavior, but it shows up on on an EEG, right? And if you do an EEG, uh, just measure brain waves, you can see that. But hopefully that's not the case, um, and it's just that he has a vivid imagination and he's thinking about something. But teach him rapid shifting between things. That's very important. And if you want to have more information on how to do that. We have a whole section on this kind of stuff and skills um, under the executive function curriculum or under cognition. I'm not sure it could be either under either or or both. Um, and it is just called set shifting. So take a look at that. Um, 
amazing. And I will say, as scary as it is, getting that EEG, if anybody, it's kind of important. if anybody has the opportunity to do that when your child is young, to, if the doctor is offering it, don't be afraid of it, get it done. Right. Because having a baseline EEG is often very important for later on in life. So take advantage of that. Uh, Anisha wrote in, and she said, I have a two-and-a-half-year-old. Um, he had regression right before he turned two, and we started ABA two months after. Oh, Anisha, that's pretty fast. Um, he is doing around 30 hours a week of ABA, of which six hours are at school. So doing around 24 at the center of home, and the rest is at school, two and a half years old. He also does OT, speech, and PT. Additionally, he is verbal to the extent that he can label and say what he wants. I have to make school plans for next September. Uh, her questions are, do patients that recover typically do 30 to 40 hours excluding school? Is it worthwhile to keep doing school hours or just focus on APA? And is socialization important at the age of three? Next question, we're doing some supplements and going to see Dr. Rosignol in March. Okay. Are there any other providers you recommend? We're based in New York but willing to travel, obviously, because Dr. Rosignol is here in California. <laughs> Your work and talks have provided me with so much hope for my son. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. And I see that you're actually here with us, too, so that's great. I think she's joined. Oh. Um, okay, so several different things. Um, I don't know what kind of ABA they're doing with him at school. If it's in a group environment, is ABA is generally done one to one. There are situations where group ABA is beneficial and helpful. So you have to evaluate whether your child is actually learning new material from whatever they're doing in school. Um, so, and that's the I guess the measure of good ABA is learning new material and not aversive to him. So he's enjoying it or he's receiving stuff. It's at his pace. He's not getting bored. Uh, it's not too difficult. There, uh, everyone in your team is, and that applies to your other ABA as well. It's just, is it, do you see good progress? You always have to see good progress. Don't think of it as, this is just keeping my child busy. And it doesn't sound like you're, that person, but it looks like you're someone who's very, very, like, driven to do this, do the right thing. So, I think you have, if, if things are, and if also, the question about social, if your child uh, is able to socialize, if your child is aware enough of other kids and wants to interact with them, it's great. Keep him in that environment. If he is not, and then, you know, this is again, because I don't know your child, if he's not, and if he's um, kind of still very much in his own world, then it doesn't matter so much for him to be in school. Usually, I like to teach the kids a little bit of skills so that when they're in school, I can use that environment to have the child <clears throat> go up to other kids, ask other kids, or answer other kids, imitate other kids, play with them, like benefit from that environment. So if you feel like he is benefiting from that environment, then honestly, I'll say you have a pretty good set of hours, like six here, 24 there, really good. You have some speech, you have some OT, fantastic. You might want to add some recreational things, like, for instance, music class or, uh, you know, crafts, arts, whatever. But, I mean, you have it pretty well covered. Um, you just want to make sure that he's uh, continuously learning and also learning the right things. So honestly, Anisha, I would really recommend for you to get on skills, uh, you know, become a skills member and do the assessment because it's very important to teach the right lessons. Um, ABA can teach anything. Um, so it's not really about the ABA techniques, which we know you can use them to teach anything. It's about the content. So for instance, right now he's doing labels. I want to make sure your ABA provider, whoever's working with him, uh, knows how to get to start with labels, but get him by the age of five to have full sentences, know how to converse, tell jokes, pay attention to the right things in his environment, take care of his own adaptive needs. I mean, there's like a million things. And if you do the skills assessment, you'll see 
all the things that he uh, needs to achieve, right? So it's not just like the things he might be a little bit behind on, but it's how do I get from single labels to long descriptive sentences? How do I get from uh, just interacting with one person to interacting with a group? How do I get from paying attention to one stimulus to learning from my environment? How do I, so, so much stuff, right? So do skills because it's a really, really good assessment and it will really help you know where to go, right? So that is, I think, vital. What were you going to say? Well, there's so much you want to say. There is so much I want to say only because it's funny because I think you have more faith in the school system than I do. Yeah, um, I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to this something without knowing about it. And I think that that's a really measured response. Um, and I'm a, school, a former school teacher. I love school. I love educators. I don't think educators understand ABA. Right. So uh, it's possible, you know, and this is, you know, contempt without investigation. Yes, exactly yes. what you're talking about. I don't know. It's possible that these six hours of ABA, and I, <laughs> I'm putting quotes in the air because yeah. I don't believe it. I don't believe that what they're doing. I have been in classrooms where they go, don't worry, I'm doing ABA, and it's as anti-ABA yes. as anything I've ever yes. seen. So I just want to say to this parent, because, you know, it's so hard to get a robust program right now. I'm thrilled that you're doing 24 hours, and I hope it's good ABA. That's the other thing. Like, like make like sure it's good up, ABA. Yeah, make sure it's good ABA because there's people doing crap ABA, too. But if I could wish anything for you, I would say, you know, do the OT and the speech at school, but push for a 40-hour program with a really good ABA provider because it's going to be three in the fall. Yeah, yeah. And I don't, like, and that's the other, I guess it's so funny because I have the same, uh, I guess, questions or doubts it's just it matters what the quality is yes of just course. as much as it matters what the hours are yeah and it matters that not just the administration quality so like not just that your therapists need to know how to do things like a discrete trial or you know shaping and chaining and all you know extinction and all the dro's and all the procedures that are in aba it just it matters just as much if they know if your supervisor your BCBA knows how to go from A to B to C to D. Sure. All of that matters. All of that matters. Yeah, and if you have a supervisor who doesn't know how to get to executive functions, doesn't know how to get to advanced language or abstract language, yeah. you're going to be stuck. He's going to get bored. ABA is going to become aversive. If you have no, therapists right. who don't know how to do shaping and chaining. He's going to get frustrated. He's not going to want to learn. If you have a school that's wasting, so all of it needs to be watched, you know? But if you're an audit mom, which clearly you are, yes. you have regression, and two months later you had ABA, you're an audit mom. Yes. Then, you know, and if you're watching the show and learning about what good ABA is, I would say be an audit mom and fight and push for that yes. if you can. Totally. I, I just was on the a phone last night with a mom who is just hitting the wall trying to get ABA, just driving me crazy how much runaround she's getting it's hard it is hard. but but it if, is you hard. Can, if you've already got 24 hours i yeah. believe you can do it um okay we got to get to some other questions well, here but i want yes. she also asked about oh the yes, supplements and what other what other so medical you're seeing dan who is one of the best doctors which is terrific that you got in to see him he is extremely busy you can also go on his med maps which is the organization he founded and there will be a list of physicians in different areas uh, Ken Bach is in upstate New York. You can also go to Kenny. Um, and there are others, I'm trying to think, but you can look on the med maps and they're on there as well and find physicians who are in closer view. But you're seeing uh, Dan Rosignol and he's terrific. So. And I'm assuming, and I should never assume, but if you're seeing Dr. Rosignol, I, I'm assuming that you're already on Taka's website and, and looking yeah. at uh, medical because he works very closely with Taka, but if you aren't, because the other question that she had written in was about uh, what other medical interventions are worth looking into. Yeah, and so that's very, very child specific, and I think what you need to do is they will, they, they're going to want to do some blood and urine tests to see if your child is deficient and needs specific supplementation. You're going to fill out paperwork that will uh, give them an idea of if there is if there are sleep issues, if there are neurological issues, if there are gastrointestinal issues, um, and then the focus will be to treat whatever there is. 
it's not so much, you know, there's no, um, there's very few studies. So all of the studies that show children with autism have medical issues are correlational. So there's no studies that really say, oh, if your child has this medical issue, it's going to lead to autism. No causative studies. But we do know that children with autism tend to have specific issues. Uh, for instance, a lot of kids have more gastrointestinal inflammation. So whatever it is with your child, then Dan will select and help you treat that particular thing. Usually when it's regressive, he's going to be asking you a lot of questions about toxicity. And, you know, if the reaction occurred at a certain point, was it after a toxin, after an illness, after a vaccination, he's going to want to know all of that. So, and then they will work on trying to detox your child in various other ways. I just want to say that Jill wrote in and said, I agree that the school system uh, wants my son to act like uh, all the other kids. Yeah. And Susie said, I feel like schools hold back our kids from their full potential. Some of them do. I, you know, there are some people who are doing good, but yes, I have big doubts. Um, uh, I want to get to this question. Uh, and I don't know how much of this we can answer, but dear Dr. Grampiche, I saw you speak on News 12 Long Island, New York, regarding autism and its cause. I wonder if you feel it could be related to radiation emissions from cell antennas and small cell antennas, as well as Wi-Fi and cell phone radiation emissions. I have read about the relationship and listened to world-renowned activist Dr. Deborah Davis speak on this topic. Most notably, however, cell antennas and cell phone and Wi-Fi autism rates were significantly lower, 1 in 200 plus. Yeah. As cell phone and low-lying small antennas to power those phones have increased in usage throughout the world, I've noticed autism rates climbing immensely. Is there a relation? Also, are installing, uh, we are installing more and more artificial turf grass loaded with PFAs. Is that an issue? I'd love to hear your opinion on these two items of concern. And they said, thank you. Yeah. Really good question, and there is a relationship. It's an indirect relationship, but it's an interesting one. The turf issue with PFAs, that's just one other environmental toxin, and there are lots and lots of environmental toxins, right? So there are toxins on our food, pesticides, and so on. There are in our soil, there's toxins in the use of plastics. There's toxins in the environment. Uh, turf is a good example. Uh, there's a lot of toxicity in the environment now, and, and, you know, a lot of children with autism have a difficulty detoxifying um, and eliminating those toxins from their body as rapidly as the rest of us do, right? So they, they're, and obviously, if you are exposed to toxins and you have a hard time detoxifying or you have low redox, your brain is going to be affected by this. Now... The interesting connection to electromagnetic fields, so cell phones, and, you know, in the past we used to have cell towers. You don't even need them that much anymore because there's such a massive electromagnetic field between uh, above us just because of the use of our phones. So, yes, there is a huge electromagnetic field that we all live in. What that does, it's not that it's toxic by itself, but what it does is it lowers the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier is this chemical wall. Think of it as a chemical wall that controls what gets from your body and your blood into the brain. And if that is that threshold is thrown off because of electromagnetic fields, more toxicity in your body gets to your brain. So that is how it's connected, is that, yes, we all, I don't know if, you know, we all are somewhat more sluggish than, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So and that's, that is because more toxicity is getting to our brain. There's not a question about that. So that's how electromagnetic fields are connected to this. There are um, folks in our, in the, in, you know, there are scientists who work on uh, how to make a home less exposed to electromagnetic fields. Um, there are people who actually uh, produce blankets that are made of silver, for instance, and that protects the child during sleep. There are, or bedding, you know, there are 
um, you know, a lot of people who believe that they should shut down all of their uh, Wi-Fi systems when they sleep at night. There are things that you can do to help make your specific environment a little bit less exposed. But unfortunately, the world around us is, is yeah. there and it's filled and with it, it. And it's just one of, I was looking up because years ago I was going to a conference and I asked you, you said, oh, go see this talk. And I couldn't remember what her last name was, Dr. Claudia Miller, who does a whole thing on, uh, she calls it Tilted, and Tilted stands for something. Um, but there's a, because I think we all know or have experienced ourselves that you can handle a certain amount of stuff exactly like what you were talking yeah. about. But then at a certain point, it, it gets, yeah, yeah on balance, right. she calls it t- tilted, and then you, you start having a lot of autoimmune issues and things right. of that right. nature. Right. Right. Um, and she how, she has a tilted checklist to see if you are, you or your child is getting are tilted, too much. Yeah. And you have too much, and then, oh, and she has suggestions for how to make a bedroom as less toxic as possible, and... You know, and it's a graduated scale. You can make yourself fully nuts and go live off the grid. And, you know, you could do that if you, if, you know, if you had to. But there are gradations of it. Right. That you say, oh, okay, I'm going to change my toothpaste. Right. Or I'm going right. to put a water filter in or, you know, and, and then incremental changes. So there you go. Um, I do want to get to Esther. I just want to Kelly, you was just behind yeah. before that even. Kelly? Did I miss Kelly? Oh, I do. I did. All right, let's do Kelly. Hello, I have a child starting kindergarten in the fall after two years of ABA. Awesome. Um, and that, that was her saying awesome. I yeah. gave it the extra. Uh, any recommendations for how many hours he should have once starting full day kindergarten with supports and many things? Thank you, Kelly. Uh, yeah, so thank you for writing, and I wish I knew more about your child, but two years is good it's not i'm not and i have had children who've completely faded off aba after two years but i generally try to maintain aba in the afternoon after school until the child is closer to age level functioning so i can't really answer that because i don't know enough about your child but the idea is that aba continues kind of as as specialized tutoring right Um, on whatever area your child might continue to have needs. Academic, I'm not worried about because you're in school now, but we're talking about, you know, social and language and cognitive skills and executive functioning skills and adaptive skills and all the different things that your child needs to learn. So the ideal, the best thing to do is to, at this point, and usually when you start school or kindergarten, they should be offering a test. So there's like a series of testing done that can establish what areas your child is still somewhat delayed in, and that's where you focus your ABA. And so, you know, your child's going to be in kindergarten, so they're going to be 30 hours a week in school. You don't have as much time anymore, but I would still try to do maybe um, something like six or seven hours, eight hours during the week in the afternoons, and then try to do a little bit of ABA on the weekend until you feel like your child doesn't need it anymore. Really, that is the that is the, the deciding factor is I don't think my child needs it anymore because my child's learning uh, from his environment, from school, and he's not falling behind on any of those other uh, skill areas that are related to the diagnosis of autism. I almost think the more relevant question is how many hours of ABA can you get? Mm-hmm. Because how many can be stacked? I'm, you know, I'm going to guess that's a big part of the current environment that um, you should take as much as you can get. Yes. I mean, it's hard. It's hard because it is hard. that's exactly what happens, Shannon, is that a lot of kids are in school. Yeah. And then ABA providers have like a rush of people needing ABA right after school from 3 to 6 and 3 to 7. Yeah. And so, but it is important, and you keep doing ABA until your child no longer needs it. There we go. Esther, we're hugging Esther. Esther says, my four-year-old son with ASD started potty training last month and was doing well until this past week when he started having more accidents. I want to note that I just had a new baby two weeks ago. 
and they want to know, are the two related and what do we do? She had a follow-up, also other unrelated question. At what point do you recommend starting a social skills group? What skills should my child have before starting? Thank you again for all that you do. Congratulations on the new baby. That's yeah, exciting. congratulations. Uh, yeah, I mean, it could be related. A lot of times our kids, the function of their behavior is attention. So it's very, it is entirely possible that he's doing that in order to get your attention back, right? So that's one thing. The issue is what to do. And what to do is just what you would do whether or not the cause was having a new baby, which is essentially put him back on a um, more uh, structured schedule. Right? And obviously, if you have a baby who's two weeks old, I hope you have some help because it's very hard right now. But, yeah, I think it's just a matter of getting him back on a schedule and also just giving him a lot of attention, giving him, a, if possible, a little bit of alone time so that he knows you are not going to, you know, you're, you're still there for him. And I think that is a, a big part of it. But make sure you, the attention is given for good activity, good behavior. Like, don't be giving him attention when he does have an accident. That's not the right time to give attention. Schedule a different time with him every day where you are doing some activity solo with him and giving him a lot of attention at that time. And then just put him back on a structured schedule so that he doesn't have accidents. And then you can fade off again. It's got to be so hard. I, I it never is. Had it more is. Than one kid. But I, I always remember one friend of mine, she had uh, one little girl, and the little girl was three, and she had been the world to her parents. And they were having the second baby. And one of the things that she did that I just always thought, and, and it's, you can't do the same thing now, but you can do something like it. She hung this ribbon across the room in the month before she had the second baby. And every day they would take and cut one little bow off the ribbon and would say, well, one day closer to you being a big sister, yeah. you get a big sister a present big thing today, about her. Yeah. and that you're a big sister. And, and so by the time and by the time they got to the end oh, and the baby was coming, she got a big, big sister present. It was yeah. like, you finally get to see your baby. But she had built, paired it with being a big Positive sister. Stuff. It's this yeah. big thing that needs attention for totally me. Totally right. I just thought it was brilliant. Yeah, just absolutely, absolutely brilliant. Absolutely. Uh, and not an ABA person, but so, but making that yeah. that new role. Now you're a big brother. Totally. And when you're a big brother, you get to have this. Yeah, this yeah. Attention. That's right. We just, and also, like, teaching the older child something they can do with the younger child, I think, is really important. I love, love, love that. Okay, uh, we had another question that came in about the educationally rich environment. So much of our day is spent in the car, and I feel like it is wasted time. We have to go to the center, go to speech, go to OT, go to the store. I feel like that is all time my child could have used therapy. Do you have any wise words or tips? Yeah. So, many years ago, we made a set of games called Camp Discovery, which are some of our earlier lessons, and we put them on the uh, you know, app library for iTunes. So you can download Camp Discovery on an iPad, at least take advantage of your child being in the car, and uh, so that they're actually, and Camp Discovery is just one of them. There's lots and lots of really good educational software out there. So you can absolutely get your child engaged in, and it's educational, like they're actually learning things going forward. So certainly you can do that. Um, you can introduce your child to other things like music and singing when you're in the car. You know, there's other things that you can do to engage. But I hear you. I know what you're talking about. It is very hard when you're driving from one place to another, etc. Ask yourself if all of those activities are benefiting your child. I always tell people this because every parent thinks they have to do everything and you don't. You have to do the things that your child needs, right? So everybody honestly should be doing ABA because that's the way our kids learn. Uh, I'm not sure that every child needs OT, for instance. So, you know, do the evaluations, determine if the, that particular intervention is necessary and beneficial cut down and reduce to the things that are necessary and beneficial, and that'll help reduce your, your drive time a little bit. Yeah. 
And since you say that you've got all these therapies, you can also say to these people, what could I be doing in the car? Yeah. We play games all the time. Our supervisor, like, yeah, yeah I remember when we were working on colors that we would pull up to a stoplight and, and we would be like, yeah, what color is What color is this? You know, yep. And when is it going to change to yellow? And totally. what does yellow mean? Yellow means you go. And, yep. and then we would play I spy in the car. Absolutely. I, we spent so much time in the car, and, and it would became so beneficial to both of us, and I had better conversations with him yeah. because he was locked in his car. So totally. That I still will go on trips, uh, road trips with my son, just so that I can have, have that conversation. conversation. You know? too. And I remember, like, a time in the car with my kids. I remember, like, driving Sunny to uh, Thousand Oaks, which was quite a long distance, and we would always, I'd, like, tell him a story and ask him questions about it. And, like, the, you know, so you could pay attention to parts of the story. Those types of things are like I'd introduce him to all the music that I like to hear, and then we talk about that. Yeah. yeah. Conversation. There was one time when Gemini drove up and saw all of the offices up in Northern California, and we listened to books on tape. Yeah. And we would oh, discuss yeah. So nice. about, so what was the theme? Oh, I learned so much about my kid. Uh, amazing. Okay, we're almost out of time, but I do want to acknowledge that NH said, her, for her son who has the rich, uh, she said, sometimes I ask him what he's thinking about, and he says, I'm not going to tell you. That's so cute. Uh, he can that write, answer. but it still takes some time for him. He Hard to pull him out explains him exactly. I, isn't that a brilliant re- response? Well, that's an awesome response, and it automatically tells me it's not a seizure type thing, right? Because he's... He just wants to keep his thoughts private at yeah. this point. So I honestly, I do think that what Shannon, when my son was little, he um, would do the same thing. And I told him, why don't we make a book? And he then started, like, um, writing. And it was all phonetic writing at that age. He was very young. And then at the top, I would draw a line for him. He would write on the bottom multiple lines. And on the top, he would draw it. And he that became his thing for at least five years and actually I got some of those published for him printed so that they look like a book and I would say if he is into writing get him to like start writing stories or get him a tape recorder have him like record stuff on his on a phone you know like that kind of stuff so it's awesome that he's actually saying I'm gonna tell you that's kind of cute Honestly, it's funny because you know your son is screenwriter. My son studied yes, screenwriter. Yes, yes. And uh, Isn't that interesting. It That's is probably interesting. Comes from yeah, back then. Yeah. But and Jem started doing something similar. And what was because he didn't have a phone yet. But what we found was he liked a little pad that was like the shape of a phone. That was sort of a spiral thing, like a, a reporter notebook. Yeah. And and he would make uh, nobody could read it. Yeah. Nobody could read it. Yeah. And he what we found out initially was he was creating a video game. Oh. what he wanted and we have pages and pages yeah. and he can look at yeah. it now and tell you but I couldn't read That's it then. So. but that was the beginning of, of getting and now they have things oh, that yeah. you can get so your child oh, can yeah. create their own video absolutely even Nintendo we had one of them in the toy guide this year uh, that there's an element that they can build cardboard things but then the character goes into the video I know game. it's amazing it's just, this, this technology this world okay we're pretty much out of time but uh, and I think we got to everything and if we didn't I, I apologize profusely um, but I wanted to take just a second and say that we've got a wonderful wonderful guest on the show tomorrow a young man who's a filmmaker oh, great. Um, a student um, who's on the spectrum and uh, Joshua Pitney is going to be with us. And we, there's a film about his life right now that's out that you guys might have seen on social media. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But I was so interested in the film. It talks about a film that he made yeah. that we want to be talking more about. So he's going to be with us tomorrow. We're going to have some conversations about that. So that will be wonderful. Uh, so you want to tune in tomorrow for Autism Live. Same time, same bad channel, all of those wonderful things. But thank you so much. It's such a pleasure. Thank oh, you so such much. such a pleasure for me and, and to be with all of you. What a gift. All right. Uh, we will be back tomorrow. Until then, give all your kiddos a hug for me and one for you, too. Bye-bye for now. Bye, everyone. Don't forget, you can watch Ask Dr. Green live every Tuesday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific time. We hope to see you there.